Uh, you people can see my uh, screen uh, slide. Yeah, we can see it, Professor. Yeah, very good. Um, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity, Dr. Imran Aslan. Um, my topic is going to be on innovative prototype production technology and its impact on the tuber quality. This paper is a co paper. You know, it is written by three of us, uh, headed by Professor Barbara Savika of uh, Poland, and it's me, Uma Chandran, and then Pitor, who is also in Poland. We three have uh, gone in uh, with this uh, evolution of this paper presentation. Um, coming on. Yeah. See, uh, the progress, if you see on potato production, potato is almost like a common man's food. It's not a rich man's food, it's a common man's food, but it is also a luxurious food. Rich people take it as in different forms like chips and uh, dried forms, whereas people, um, you know, um, uh, people in poor countries take it as a staple food. Their you know, uh, living happens by eating potatoes. Many, many uh, countries in Africa, and then in, uh, in other em uh, impoverished uh, countries are still using potato for their life. But this potato production is dependent on three aspects. One is called the biological aspect. The second is the technical and third is called the technological. We are going to see all this, but in a uh, concentration where emerging technology is going to be used. See, if I'm going to use this uh, technology for biological purpose, you know, it is, if you, you have it for biology, it is new, it, it has better quality and it, uh, you know, it is a, a, a thing which can go into the habitat where you can grow it and use it. It's a sustainable living process. So you need not go and buy. You can create it, you can plant it and make it uh, you know, blossom in your own gardens or in your farms. The technical uh, things which are affecting this are the machines and devices that are uh, used for production, for potato production. And the technology is where how to improve or increase the cultivation that is going to be hap hampering this potato production. We are going to see all these three. Now coming on to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the factors. See, factors for a, uh, in a farmer. A farmer is the poor person who is uh, um, on a sustainability using his means for uh, farming and making a produce and then selling it out and getting. But this poor farmer has no influence on the climate factors. He cannot control the climate, uh, climate factors and he has very small influence on the edaphic factors. That is whatever he could try, that factors are very less. The biological factors are also limited because if the seed uh, is the one which he's going to plant, he cannot know what is happening in the seed. So the biological factors is also a thing which is of a concern to a farmer. And the agro-technical factors, which is of greatest influence because that is the one which is being facilitated either by the government or he is getting from the market and he is using it. So when people are all saying, you know, this is good, then they use it. The influence largely, you know, there are a lot of technologies that are influencing this potato production. Coming on to the breeding, because here we are seeing if you want to increase the production of, uh, uh, you know, uh, potatoes, you should have something called a new breeding technology. It's not planting a seed in the soil and then you get it. There are a lot of new breeding technologies like Talon, CRISPR, and you have genetic engineering. And then uh, all these things go on for improving the agronomic profile of the potato. Talon is nothing but a transcription activator, like effective nucleosis. This is one kind of a method they have. Then they have the CRISPR, which is a clustered, regularly interlaced, palindromic uh, in a, uh, activity that happens with the breeding between uh, in a reproduction of uh, more potatoes. Okay. Coming on to the new technologies, what happens is if you have improved nutritional value, then more potato will be consumed. If this, it is less resistance to bi biotech, if anything which can ha you know, affect the production of, bio uh, uh, production of bi uh, potato, if that can be uh, resisted, then that can also improve the uh, yield and productivity of uh, potatoes. And then uh, abiotic uh, stresses and increased yield that can facilitate production of potato are all happening. Again, coming here, we have something called GM potato. GM potato is something, a genetically modified one, which is being pushed all across the world, mostly into Africa, Asia, and other parts of the world. They are saying that this has a nutritional value. It has taste and appearance. And it is having a lot of starch quality. 
and it is uh, having less of CAS activity so that it can be easily sold because of a less cost. Now coming on to uh, what can be done with the product uh, potato technology. See the selection of cultivars. Cultivars is the one which you are going to put it in the soil so that from there the potato is going to sprout out. Then the certified seeds is another factor that has to be taken into account. It is not the farmer who is certifying. Somewhere, somewhere an agro technologist is going to certify it. They are doing it in one part of the world and it is being used in another part of the world which may or may not be useful for the person or the farmer who is using it. Then coming on to the plant density. You know, between plants, how much these uh, you know, potatoes have to be put in. And then the fertilization, uh, fertilizations, irrigations, then the scope of the plant itself. Every plant is unique by itself. It, it, it cannot be going by a formula. So there's a life in the plant and the scope of the plant is also having its uh, aspect and then the mode of uh, you know, harvesting and the preparation of sales. These are the factors that are uh, you know, uh, described as a, a accessible or a, a safe uh, uh, technology that can be used for potato growing. Now, coming on to uh, the cultivation technologies. There are many cultivation technologies uh, like narrow striped or broad rupture. This is what is a normal way our uh, farmer does for potato. But what we are going to see here is tram lines, bed technology, and semi rich technology. Uh, coming on to the uh, tram line. Tram line, what they do is they avoid compaction and deformation of bridges. When you want to plant a, uh, in a potato, uh, you know, around it, you have to have a kind of a compaction so that the plant you know, grow, goes, uh, grows in, in a straight form. You, you see the uh, picture uh, which has been shared here. So you, you will know how uh, you know, the, the potato farming happens on a straight line. But when you are going to have plants like that, you should not press it too much so that the potato, the potato grows in the roots. So you should not press it too much and the mechanical damages should not happen there. This is the tram line where you can have more uh, uh, you know, productivity. And the second aspect is called the bed technology. Bed technology is, can you see this uh, machine which is creating a kind of a bed you know, over which you are going to plant the uh, potatoes and then you will have access to go around and you know, cultivate, you can uh, do the harvesting and all those stuff. Okay, this is the bed technology. And the third is the semi ridge. Uh, in the earlier first one, we saw a ridge. Now it is semi ridge. One, part, one side it will be ridge, and another side it will be a kind of a bed so that you, can, you have more uh, you know, uh, uh, plants growing up. So this uh, you know, kind of a semi ridge has a lot of uh, benefits. What they are saying is they, you take into account the soil and the climatic conditions, improves productivity by 30%, and effectiveness of new technology is because of the mobile unit. You, you can have your units move, moving around to take uh, the harvesting part. And all. So all these things are facilitating production, uh, production and uh, potatoes. This is again a farm, uh, you know, semi-ridge only, where the high yields and high quality of products we can obtain. We can have a better control on weeds, pests, and diseases. And then using modern uh, equipments and polluting, uh, you know, uh, pollutions that affect the environment can also be taken care. Coming on to the uh, new aspects. See, earlier we saw potato was growing inside water, uh, you know, soil. Here we are going to see hydrophonics. It means potato will be grown under water. This is the place where you are going to see uh, you know, potato getting onto water, where you see uh, you have the plants in the top uh, um, uh, above a plant, and then below which you have water, so that the roots are always uh, in, a, in a position to have water. Cultivation of plants and water media production in artificial home conditions. This is where uh, the new technology has gone. It's a hydrophonic uh, uh, assignment where you have light on the top. You can have a overflow. If uh, it, uh, it goes more than the plant, you can get it back. Then you have a tray to collect the water. Then you have filling pipes to fill the water. Then you have mixing tanks so that you can add the nutrients and your fertilizers, etc. And then you create a better solution and then you pump it up to the grow tray. So this is the hydrophonic. In, in place of soil, you use water to uh, you know, make potato grow. When you use this kind of a um, method, the elimination of soil and allergens, if soil has allergens that affects the production uh, in a potato production, these things are avoided here. Even in small place, you can use it. You can use it uh, in order to, to control the root ball. You can shape it properly. And then extended periods of watering uh, can be avoided. Reduced the frequency of transplanting and uh, you know, uh, handling the humidity, et cetera, can be done in a nice way. 
This is what is the benefit of hydroponics. In addition, you can get high quality speed of a seed material. Harvest can be repeated. You need not wait and you need to dug uh, the soil. Here you need to get it only from the plant uh, in a water and you can easily pluck out. Young, small sized can be used because if you want to use more of, uh, consume young um, uh, potatoes, more uh, potatoes, you can uh, do it. And agricultural yield is not produced above the surface. So don't worry about it. Whatever nutrition you're giving, it is given directly to the potato. So that's the benefit of a hydroponic. And then the next concept, which is called the aerophony. We saw it in water. First we saw it in soil, then in water, now in air. This is called aerophonics. If you want to grow potatoes in air, then what you have to do is, this growing a plant in air or fog without the use of soil or other dense material is the concept on which this is work. Aerophonic systems use less water. It's just sprinkling is enough for the plants to get water. And the platforms on the top of the tank is better enough. It can close and it's a greenhouse effect. So you can protect it from the natural calamities. The aerophonic system, you see the person who is walking down in his garden, he has uh, inner plants on both the sides. So he, the, uh, the roots are visible. It, it, he's creating a, a nutrient air circulation so that the growth happens. If you see the bottom picture, you can easily see where the potatoes are growing and he can easily pluck it. Okay. See, yes, uh, the difference between the other production to uh, uh, you know, uh, aerophonics is if you take a potato, you can see dark uh, spots. The roots are dark. If it is an uh, uh, aerophonics, in other things, the darkness will not be there. It will be light. And this is the uh, main difference which you will have. And uh, it is very effective uh, you know, for, as a cultivator. Uh, the, here, you can control the diseases. Whatever is going to affect the plant or the potato can be easily controlled because you can watch it. But if it happens anywhere in, in a, a soil, you cannot see. So the, this is the main advantage of, of this aeroponic system. Now, coming on, I, I'll be using another three slides to complete. The new technology, what we are adopting. The world has changed. Everyone has mobile phones, everyone has GIS and everything. So how farmer is going to use this science? Mapping of soil is going to be done. He can measure its yield. And then he can use robotics to uh, thing. He can use drones to fly over his farms. He can do a satellite imagery and sit in his room and uh, manage it. So there's a lot of things that can go in helping a farmer become modern. So here, the GPS of sensing and dosages at a right system on a control system, you can do as a in a virtual condition. It's not like you have to go. You, you have facilities or drones or robots to go and help you out in your farming activities. Tracing, tracking, and improving performance are all better for improving productivity and better controls is where the emerging technology is going to Effect. Coming on to this uh, thing, um, the emerging technology has a wider uh, you know, inspection view, like the routing depth it can measure, it can uh, see, check uh, water holding capacity, it can check your pH levels, the organic ma matter, the seed tuber can be visually seen, it can be a uh, fertilizers can be known how much is being put, protection agents can be controlled, how much of water is being consumed, everything can be done. This is where the DSS come. DSS, you have a protection for this, uh, for this growth, where the planting times you can have, the control losses you can have, the sh uh, scheduling, how much time you should have, what kind of a hardware you're going to use, right row spots between plants, how much of a distance, and the soil mapping so that you can uh, you know, think and work rather than going there and working. And then the geospatial IT so solutions like soil sampling techniques. You know, you can take it, find out what is uh, the soil strength, what are the ingredients in it, uh, the nutrients in it, everything. Watching cautious for the yield, what is affecting, what is not affecting. Identifying through plant sensors. You can see through uh, enough sensors how the growth of the uh, thing and how it is being affected, the intensity, everything. Now coming on to the remote sensing. Farmer is going to be working in an office. It's not like he is going and toiling. He will have his practical work. But he can also do his thinking part. This is where emerging technology comes. The type, health, soil, moisture, concentration of nitrogen, etc., can be done in a um, uh, in an office space. Then multi-spread imagery. He can sit in a place and then he can watch around what kind of a uh, you know um, growth has happened in his farm. Observe the planting uh, you know concentrations, the yield estimates, etc. 
these things can be obtained in a three dimensional not only in 2d you can tilt and see how the real plant is happening how the biomass is getting engaged with the pores and simpler resolutions of the images and all these things can be as as you are in a real time you can sit and watch and get used to this emerging technology for your plant and the farming operations thereby you can increase productivity yield income improvised technology market expansions ex everything so farm prosperity for potato production is an activity management that can be handled through emerging technology i think thank you thank you very much professor krishna uh, for your uh, valuable uh, presentation and the the potato they have a, a important place in uh, our food sector and in your uh, everything i think they are used and they you try to any kind of uh, potatoes uh, i don't uh, i don't know whether they will be healthy or not i think this question maybe you know better than me but if you have any questions uh, you can ask the professor krishna uh, <laughs> no question uh, from uh, listeners i don't see any questions so professor krishna no, no uh, next to me is uh, uh, my professor uh, dr barbara uh, you know i have a question yeah yeah i are they healthy i mean uh, especially you introduced the genetically modified potatoes mm -hmm. and uh, you used the uh, you you explain you mentioned about the potatoes without using the land but using the water and the nutrition so uh, are they healthy we can say that they can provide the nutrition but are they healthy really uh, you know uh, healthy per se if you take a plant plant is not having a difference it is only in the way how we use it like if you have a potato and if you boil and cook it and use it it is always healthy if you fry and use it see because all these mass productions are for are for, for you know making chips Uh, and uh, other uh, things the, uh, the that is where the multinational companies are coming why do one uh, why do they want to increase the potato production it's because they want more production for making crispy you know fried chips and yes. you know uh, these are the things for which they are trying but uh, you can use, you know anyone can use the um, uh, potatoes as a, as a staple food it's always a healthy aspect how we use is the matter you mean but, the uh, content and the the production process what they at uh, after productions hmm. and nutrition they used uh, maybe they they will affect the health of people right it all depends if they uh, use some kind of a boosters sudden boosters for making the plant grow, grow faster then this will have more fertilizers if you have organic fertilizers it's good hmm. if you have inorganic fertilizers it's going to affect okay. so okay. that is where we called uh, fried potatoes as junk food Mm -hmm. ah. see the Any youngsters questions? are having more of uh, fried potatoes and coke so they spoil their health yeah, i understand any question to professor krishna if no the next presenter are or presenter here uh, you uh, can have the, uh, dr barbara uh, we have, uh, barbara is here uh, professor barbara can you hear me uh, hello Uh, now the professor barbara you can share your screen if you want uh, uh, the her presenter she will present sweet potato as an uh, as a uh, an alternative to the clim climate change in europe uh, professor barbara oh, yes uh, she already uh, sh shared the screen okay you good can morning, start your Al. presentation good morning all I would like uh, to thank you for uh, inviting me to your conference and wish uh, you fruitful uh, deliberation and successes. And uh, my topic. The sweet potato uh, in Latin, uh, Ipomea batatas, uh, which has been domesticated uh, in uh, tropical america is gradually becoming on the uh, world uh, major food crops according to the uh, food and uh, agriculture organization of uh, united nation uh, world uh, sweet potato production exceeded 
19 million tons in 2080. The main producers are China, Brazil, India, and the United States. The sweet potato is the seventh most important crop in the world and plays a significant role in the food security and the nutritional requirements and millions of people in Asia, Africa, and America. This grade uh, also the, uh, has great potential uh, for commercial use and, uh, uh, and uh, industrial uh, raw materials. Uh, sweet potato has an important place in the diet of people. Uh, These uh, species are uh, considered an important part of the food security um, package uh, for some countries in the world. All the plant parts uh, of sweet potato are uh, used uh, as animal feeds. Uh, and uh, production and area of sweet potato cultivation in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, in recent years, uh, a slight reduction in uh, cultivation area uh, and production has been uh, observed. Uh, the share of countries in the global production of sweet potato in the world the China is the main producer on the world. Uh, chemical composition um, uh, of sweet potato. Sweet potato are rich in many nutrition, uh, such as starch, protein, vitamins, dietary fiber, and minerals, as well as uh, over ingredients, uh, beneficial to human health, uh, including flavonoids, carotenoids, and over secondary metabolites. Mm, that is uh, phytosterols, uh, chlorogenic acid, uh, caffeic acid, uh, and uh, another substance uh, of uh, potato tubers uh, contained, that is uh, lutein and uh, zeoxanthin. Uh, these uh, pigments uh, can prevent uh, arteriosclerosis, uh, some cancers, and AA disease. Uh, some pectins, uh, potassium, and uh, element uh, present in the amount of uh, about uh, 400 milligram in one tuber helps to lower blood pressure. Uh, the risk of coronary heart disease uh, and uh, kindly stones and stroke. Uh, vitamin B uh, for depression and uh, insomnia. Uh, vitamin C, uh, C um, supports uh, wound uh, healing, uh, prevents to degenerative uh, AA disease. Uh, and introduction of sweet potato in Southeastern Europe. Climate change uh, in the world, climate change in uh, Europe. Uh, Europe is generally characterized by a temperate, uh, temperate climate. Most uh, of uh, Western Europe was an uh, oceanic climate with uh, cool summers and cool winters. Uh, Southern Europe uh, has a characteristic Mediterranean uh, climate characterized by uh, warm to hot, uh, dry summer and mild uh, winter. And Central and Eastern Europe, including Poland, is uh, classified uh, as uh, having a continental climate with warm to hot summers and uh, cold winter. Climate change in Europe uh, has increased the temperature about uh, two degrees Celsius in uh, 
European Union compared to the pre-industrial area. The rise in global temperature should not exceed uh, two degrees Celsius to prevent the worst impact of uh, climate change uh, without uh, limiting carbon dioxide uh, emission that might uh, occur before 2050. High average uh, uh, air temperature allows the cultivation of plant species in Europe considered to be uh, exotic, such as sweet potato. Uh, now, sweet potato is uh, already grown in uh, many European countries, including Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, and France. Uh, this is an uh, important uh, plant not only for southwestern uh, Europe, but uh, also for uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe, uh, where the demand for safe uh, gluten-free food and uh, vegetarian diet uh, uh, is constantly um, growing. So there was an opportunity to diversify uh, uh, crops uh, in this uh, region of Europe. Uh, for sweet potato consumers, uh, the taste cr criteria are the most important. Uh, the cultivars with orange flesh contain more carotenoids than cultivars with uh, white uh, or cream uh, colored uh, tuber flesh. The purple flesh uh, uh, varieties uh, are very rich in uh, diclofenic acid. Uh, 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 the purple flesh uh, cultivars of uh, sweet potato are characterized by a high uh, content of uh, secondary metabolites, uh, mainly vitamins and phenolic compounds, uh, which uh, help to prolong uh, our life. Uh, for example, the inhabitants of uh, Okinawa Island, uh, Japan, eat purple flesh uh, cultivars and life an average uh, uh, of 105. Uh, Sugar-free uh, varieties have uh, also been identified. There, are, uh, there is a positive correlation also um, uh, found uh, between starch and uh, dry matter uh, content and a negative correlation between starch content and protein, minerals, fiber, and sugars. Sweet potato is a functional food. In recent years, functional food has become more and more popular all over the world. Uh, which has an uh, additional uh, documented impact uh, and human health. Uh, this food helps to reduce the risk of uh, developing civilization diseases such as uh, obesity, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. One of the ways uh, to prevent the disease is food uh, enriched uh, with uh, various uh, bioactive ingredients as vitamins, minerals, uh, fatty acids, uh, which reduce the risk of developing civilization disease. Uh, sweet potato is one of the functional foods, food. Uh, Sweet potato is rich in minerals and vitamins. Uh, lack of uh, vitamins and minerals causes tens of uh, thousands of deaths uh, each year in Asia and Africa. 
é, do eto serve vitamina uh, A, deficiency, mortality in young children in developing countries is 16%. Uh, subclinical death from vitamin A deficiency uh, is uh, um, over 20% in school age mortality. The orange uh, flesh of the sweet potato contains the most promising plant uh, sources of uh, provitamin A, but uh, white or yellow uh, flesh uh, provides uh, little or uh, no vitamin A. Um, resistance, um, our um, cultivar to drought stress is a very uh, important uh, tema. In genetic uh, research of uh, particular interest is the stress regulated uh, protein, uh, which uh, was isolated from uh, DNA. Uh, the uh, uh, gene uh, is 15% uh, identical to the cold uh, acclimation uh, protein from triticum uh, estivum. Uh, this uh, prompting the use of the uh, genetic stress uh, for genetic engineering uh, of uh, sweet potatoes. Mm, very mm, important is to resistant uh, of sweet potatoes to draw uh, stress. Uh, cultivation of Ipoma batatas plants is uh, unfavorable environmental conditions depends on the plant's uh, adaptation to stress and physiological and metabolic changes uh, in the endogenous uh, development system. Sweet potato is commonly grown in a marginal uh, land due to uh, relatively uh, very high tolerance to abiotic stress. Drought stress, uh, uh, inhibits crop yield and diversely affects uh, the expansion of sweet potato cultivation. Improving drought tolerance is uh, essential to adapt sweet potato crops uh, to environmental stress and uh, increase uh, productivity. Um, improving uh, the traits uh, of sweet potatoes uh, uh, is conventional breeding uh, is limited by labor-intensive uh, genetics. And introducing sweet potato in Poland. Uh, in my country, research uh, on the introduction of sweet potato has been conducted uh, for 20, uh, over uh, 20 years. I got the first uh, a Kananua um, variety from my PhD student from West Guinea, one tuber. No. Since when uh, we have studied more than 10 uh, cultivars, including uh, with white, orange, pink, and purple uh, flesh. Uh, in Polish conditions, uh, variety origin uh, from Israel uh, are the best, but uh, we uh, also study Italian, American, Canadian, and Japanese um, varieties. Allow the yield in not com comfortable to the American uh, varieties in experiments is already middle uh, and shows high nutritional and energy value. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, field experiments with uh, sweet potatoes in Poland. And uh, yield uh, of sweet potato in the uh, world, uh, the most uh, uh, yield is in uh, Australia and New Zealand. And the small the last is in uh, Oceania and Africa. Uh, sweet potato uh, biodiversity. Uh, we uh, have in our experiment 10 
10 cultivars about yellow, cream, white, orange, and violet flesh. And conclusion. The high nutrition and uh, energy value of sweet potato with uh, antioxidant, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory and resistant to climate change properties was interest in the species uh, in Europe. Uh, the sweet potato can be a food security plant for farmers as well as uh, a commodity plant. Currently, orange uh, variety, uh, varieties are promoted uh, due to the high content of provitamin A. Uh, the distribution of sweet potatoes uh, varieties in Europe will have a direct impact on the biodiversity. The introduced uh, varieties uh, will directly contribute uh, to increase the productivity and economic effects in conventional and uh, ecological agriculture system. Mm, this will increase the availability uh, uh, of material for uh, various uh, high quality produced with health benefits for consumers and economic benefits for products. And added uh, value of two European uh, research and innovation. The um, added, uh, added uh, value of sweet potato research is given Europe access to board uh, genetic base and building partnership uh, through a network of research institutes and universities focus on organic farming system. A new pest and disease resistant genotypes of Ipomea batatas must be obtained. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, this is very important. Uh, farming product because uh, we have droughts now in Turkey and the we have low low water actually we have a low rain now and I think in the in Turkey we should consider also sweet potato because still we use mainly the the traditional potato but sweet potato is not very common in Turkey and hopefully that uh, we will use this opportunity so any question to Professor Barbara just you can raise your hand or you can uh, directly talk if you have any questions to Professor Barbara. Can you, any question? No question? And thank you. If no question, we will uh, uh, go to the next presentation. Uh, and what is the, this, uh, do you think this one is uh, better than the traditional potato, Barbara? In which, in which way it is, uh, this potato is better? Nutrition, uh, mm. stress to drought? Mm, nutrition, I think, but it's very, um, uh, important is uh, nutrition in uh, sweet potato. More and, nutrition. Uh, uh, and um, resistant to uh, to drought. To drought, okay. And healthy, which one is healthy? This one or the traditional one? Mm. You said it's better for uh, diabetes, for the... the to organic uh, system, uh, in Ambestan, but in traditional too. Ah, okay. Okay, no questions. So they, they sent your thanks to you from the... some. Uh, some listener, they send uh, thanks to you uh, in the message. If no question, Hello. we will go to the next. Any question? Hello, please. Yes. Yeah, you can ask your question direct. Okay. Yeah. Peter please, Prof. Okoro. Yeah, I want to know more <coughs> on um, the variety, the Apumudin variety. Um, that is the uh, orange fresh sweet potato. So uh, if it is preferred to other ones in terms of 
micronutrients. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Barbara, have you understand the question? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Orange, uh, orange uh, potato, or, orange uh, uh, flesh in sweet potato is very good for uh, our uh, nutrition, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, cultivars have uh, much uh, provitamin A. But it's uh, very important for children for um, for age two. Okay. Uh, John Peter Okoro. <laughs> Uh, John Okoro, can you hear me? John Peter Okoro, okay. Peter Okoro. Yes, I hear you. Uh, I you can hear you. Answer? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Can you get your answer, Barbara? Yes. Thank you, Barbara. No other question? So we go I... to the next presentations, if no other question. Okay. Uh, any other pre other presenter? Uh, from uh, Africa, South Africa. Aden Tunji is here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, you can share your screen and you can start your presentation. He's, uh, he's from uh, South Africa and he will present Scope and Review, Advanced in TB Journey. It is challenges and the sustainability. So please start to your presentation. If you can agree, uh, share your screen. Okay, we can your, see your screen now. You can start. Okay. Okay, good day, everyone. I am presenting on the on a scoping review that says adherence in TB journey, the challenges and its sustainability. The purpose of the study, sorry. The purpose of the study is to explore factors affecting medication adherence, the challenges being faced by patients and its sustainability approach. We are considering the component that affects medication adherence in this study and further underlining issues that hinders adherence over a long term. When we look at TB patients, we only see few things that make them not adhere to medication that there are other, other underlying issues that we need to consider, and that's what this study is about, and how we can use the existing literature to help in identifying issues consisting medication, constituting medication non-adherence. The objective is to review and interrogate the usefulness of existing literatures on the elements that constitute medication non-adherence and to explore the elements for long-term TB adherence to medication. From the introduction and background, we could establish that tuberculosis is an infectious disease. It is curable, but remain a significant health problem due to medication non-adherence. There have been so many work done to make sure they cure TB, people get healed, people that are infected with the disease. But the fact that they don't adhere to medication, they do not adhere to their medication, there's always a problem of not being healed and the problem, the sickness still consists of it persists. About 1.5 million people have died from TB. That is from the, uh, for the record of the year 2020. And also in the year 2020, it is recorded that South Africa is also part of the countries that has a highest number of TB cases. Other countries include China, Indonesia, the Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. So based on South African statistics, it is established that people living with tuberculosis, most of them are undiagnosed and untreated. Some of them, they don't even know that they have TB. And this is part of the problem that we have in South Africa here. 
around 80% of South African population is infected with tuberculosis bacteria. The number is increasing and some are even latent TB. The age group, between the age group of 30 and 39 years old are the people that are mostly infected. These are people that live in the suburbs and rural areas of South Africa. They are primarily infected and they have the estimated amount, a big percentage of 88. Tuberculosis is one is a, is a top cause of death in South Africa. And according to record of 2029, 58,000 people died from tuberculosis. And 36,000 of them were also HIV positive. So it is established that TB is a leading infectious disease killer and among the top 10 causes of death worldwide. Mod medication non-adherence is fundamental because all efforts to stop it has not been successful. Methods that has been used to cure TB include self-monitoring programs, telephone follow-up, all these are ineffective in reducing medication non-adherence. And W. HO, World Health Organization 2, has done, has done a lot of work in controlling TB, but it remained uncontrolled due to non-adherence to medication. From the review carried out, factors contributing to medication non-adherence in South Africa include socioeconomic factors, behavioral factors, patient-related factors, healthcare system problem, treatment complexity, lack of knowledge of the disease and treatment. Also the self-monitoring program, sorry, medication non-adherence is costly, is multifaceted and common issues that causes mere grad treatments because people don't, they, there's no funds to help people in developing countries, especially. Moreover, non-adherence is hard to measure precisely and the solution to stop it or to curb it has been very, very unsuccessful. So from the review carried out, factors that affect medication adherence include patient-related issues, which are age-based, gender-based, ethnicity, which has to do with culture, with belief, people's belief here in South Africa. There are issues that are related to patients that makes them not to adhere to medication. When they look at the situation that surrounds them, some of them, they, they are abused. They are abused people. They have psychological stress and they are also depressed. When people are in this state, they will not adhere to medication. Also structural and economic issues. This is very, very difficult to assess among people because Non-adherence takes place among people that are poor, people that are homeless. Most people that are in the villages, they are unemployed. They don't have a source of income. They don't have anything to do. And ineffective economic supports make life very unsafe for people. And so this brings about non-adherence because they don't have means of taking care of themselves. Healthcare delivery problem. When we look at our healthcare system, the, the, uh, the, uh, the organization is not in order. There's lack of communication to patients to come for treatment. They don't get the necessary information they need. People, there are lack of expertise, inflexibility in the operating hours. They are part of the things that constitutes to medication non-adherence in TB patients in South Africa. There are also behavioral issues too. When we look at TB patients, when they go to health care or health care centers, they have issues of satisfaction. There are no proper relationships which are challenging to people. Health care workers are overworked. There's lack of knowledge about TB. Staff are inadequately supervised. All these things bring about a lot of burden on the health care workers. And so also it affects the, the patients as well. There's complexity in treatments. When people look at the, the period of time that they will engage in taking medication for, uh, for the treatment, they feel so burdened within them and they feel like they, they have to stop because they could not cope with the treatment period. 
Also, when we look at the knowledge towards TB, a lot of people that are infected with this disease, they don't really have the knowledge of what TB means, what it could do to them. They don't know that it could be treated. The time of treatment, the lengthening period of treatment is also a problem. They don't have adequate knowledge. They don't have understanding of the treatment procedure too. And TB patients, they stop treatment once they notice that they are getting treat, I mean, they are getting healed or they are seeing a sign of they are being cured sort of. Meanwhile, until they complete the dose for the specified period of time, they will not be cured. But some of them stop treatment because they feel they are being cured. And that one also is part of issues that contribute to medication non-adherence. The method we use in the study is a scoping review. And we search some academic databases online to get some articles that we use for the study, which range from the year 2000 to the year to December 2020. And here is the breakdown and the analysis of the articles used to get the data that, uh, for the presentation. Now we are talking about TB patient pathway. This is about the TB journey. When we look at TB patients, they have to be diagnosed at the initial stage. Immediately, a, a patient discovers that they are sick, they will go to the clinic or to the nearby health care center for treatment. So a disease such as TB requires long-term treatment that cannot be measured just by refining diagnosis and treatment adherence in health care centers. The first thing that has to be done is healthcare system is needed to be at, uh, to alert patients of TB symptoms. When there are healthcare systems in all the rural areas everywhere, patients will be able, or people that they have symptoms, they will be able to go to the clinic and they will, be, they will identify them as presumptive TB patients. That is at the initial stage. The next thing is to diagnose them once they go to the clinic at the early stage, they have the, the, the system with if effective or efficient mechanism will handle them, they will diagnose them as TB patients. The next thing is they will instigate them for treatment, enroll them so that they will start their treatment immediately. Then if there's need for them to be referred for further checkup or for further tests, that will also be done. All these are done at the initial stage when they discover that these people are infected. And after, the, after this, there's also the process of treatment, which will be done at the HK. And after that, they have to move on to the medication, uh, medication phase, which is not part of what has been discussed in the TB journey here. The first stage that, is, that people will, uh, the TB patients know is the initial stage of identification, the second stage of diagnosis, the third stage of enrolling, enrolling TB patients in the hospital for treatment. The hospital and the staff will provide support for them and care for them. But the phase where they are having issue is when they have to take their medication for a period of at least four months or six months, which is not included in what they, they already have knowledge of. So by the time they are no more at the health center, they are at home or wherever, for them to stick to the medication prescription, that is where the problem comes in. And they look at it that it's becoming burdensome for them to adhere to. So from this study now, it's making use of iceberg theory to analyze behavioral patterns that affect the patient in adhering to medication over a long period of time. Four months or six months is not, is not a joke for TB patients to take their medication consistently every day for that period. So this theory, this theory, iceberg theory, is defined as the intent of a writer not being noticeable from the surface. But most part of eating, of most part is eating under the surface. Using this approach, most factors contributing to medication non-adherence in TB patients are not seen at the surface but they are hidden underneath the iceberg that should be explored. We need to look deeply into what is causing non-adherence in TB patients for us to 
provide a sustainable solution to medication adherence. That's why we are using this theory now to look into the factors that are contributing to medication non-adherence. According to Azen, he listed that individual factors, physical factors, organizational factors, community factors, and societal factors. They are underlining factors that are contributing to medication non-adherence, which we need to, which we explored in this study to see what could be done. Individual factor is referred to the tip of the iceberg. That's, that is, okay, can I move on? Individual factor referring to the tip of the iceberg is just part of the factors with components and various elements affecting TB patients. There are other underlying factors that are not seen. And those factors are under the social environmental factors, which iceberg will help us now to explore. Each factor is built on deeper components and elements that contribute to non-adherence to medication in the long term. For medication, for adherence to TB patients, more attention needs to be paid to the components and elemental issues facing, the patient, facing TB patients. And we'll look at those factors deeply now. When we look at this diagram, the tip of the diagram is showing the individual. That is what, th those are the things that we look at in individual and we say that they don't keep to medication adherence. That is the first level. The first level says intrapersonal. And the issues relating to the personal person is the behavior or the life or the lifestyle of the person that we see. They, we, they complain about complex regimen, their physiological state. You see, when they are stressed because of their sickness, they will not adhere to medication. Other underlying factors that are below the waterline, they are the level two interpersonal. That is the family, the friends, the relative, and the spouse. Are they supporting TB patients? Are they giving them the necessary help? Are they giving them the psychological assistance, the emotional assistance needed? When all these are not received, patients will feel depressed and they will stop their medication. Organizational factors are also listed here as the level three. Level three, we talk about the work, uh, workplace, health organization, club and association, low education, when the society is not helping people, where the organization where they belong is not helping them, it's making them feel rejected and not welcome. They will not, take, they will not stick to their medication and they will not take it, they will stop their medication. Our community too, necessary things that is needed in the community, is it provided for them so that they'll be able to access healthcare facilities, basic amenity, transportation, finances, unemployment issues, ethnicity, you see, all these things are in the, at the community level, and they are also contributing to non-adherence to medication. Lastly, when we look at the level five, that is the society where everybody belongs. We talk about infrastructure, health facilities, stigmatization, society stigmatized TB patients. They don't have adequate knowledge. Government policies are not favorable. The society believe about TB patients. All these things are making TB patients not to adhere to their medication because they are not welcome in the society. Society is not making things easier for them. And th these are underlying issues that we really need to look into and see the way for us to build a sustainable approach to, med uh, to medication adherence. Here we now said adherence to long-term medication in TB patients is affected by many factors identified as socioeconomic, behavioral, patient-related, health facility-related, and complex therapy or regimen. These factors are further affected by other components from patient background, knowledge, social status, and societal components, which contribute to non-adherence in patients. Stigma-related issue is also very, very important which make the patient afraid. Patient life experience is a major contributing factor too. Whether there's poverty, joblessness, financial problem, and unfriendly health workers, 
definitely TB work, uh, TB patients will not adhere to medication. They will rather stay away from their medication. According to iceberg theory, all factors will be unidentified by the behavioral pattern. We will not be able to identify all issues that is contributing to non-adherence. But by carefully analyzing what underlying factors are and start by identifying each and then provide a solution that will be sustained. Treatment adherence should be maintained for the patient to be cured to avoid the disease developing into a more complex drug resistance situation. Understanding how these factors interconnect over a period is significant for improving the research program on discovering sustained health interventions. In conclusion, this article assesses the level of adherence in TB patients receiving medication for a long-term period. Although previous literature have highlighted some factors affecting medication adherence, this study, this study also revealed additional components and elements that constitute more to patient behavior to non-adherence. Hence, to provide a sustained support to TB patients, the components and elements that result in non-adherence behavior should not be overlooked. A sustained intervention can only be effective when strategies are developed to address these factors from the foundation and not only issues that appear through individual behavior. Thank you. Contributions and questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think the, the, the adherence to the uh, tuberculosis uh, is a problem now. We have the same problem uh, in the COVID times that many people, they don't adherence the medications or they don't care about the rules and this kind of things. Uh, so this, I think, is a big issue in Africa, right? Yeah. Because they don't uh, adherence the medication and they, they cannot be cured well, and then this uh, illness can uh, come back again or can be worse, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any questions to the, uh, about these uh, presentations? To You can raise your hand or you can directly ask the question to the uh, Rosa Adetunji Adet about the tuberculosis adherence. Uh, Professor Dixon, you can ask the questions directly. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, I joined quite late, okay. but uh, on your last slide, I heard you talking about stigma and how we can use the iceberg theory. Yeah. So I just want to see the connection, what you presented on the and the iceberg theory and how it is related to fighting stigma. Okay. What I spoke about on iceberg theory, let me bring up the slide. Iceberg theory is talking about analyzing behavioral pattern that affects patients in adhering to medication. But when we look at iceberg theory, it states that we cannot see every factor, all the factors affecting behavioral pattern from the surface. We really need to look deep down onto other underlying factors that are affecting non-adherence in patients. That's where iceberg theory comes in. That is not only those things that we see from the surface that is affecting people from adhering to medication. But when we look deeply, then that's why we analyzed it further into this table or this figure here that other factors that contribute to non-adherence includes stigmatization. Because people in the society are being stigmatized. People with TB are not welcome. Once people get to know that it's a TB patient, they don't want to relate or associate with them. That is where stigmatization comes in. I don't know whether I've answered your question. Yes, you have um, a, a quick one, a follow up. So okay. how, how do we solve the issue of stigma against TB patients? What's your recommendation? 
Thank you. Well, okay. Uh, my recommendation would be that we shouldn't label them or tag them as something that is not treatable. So fat TB is also treatable. So the society should give them that period to go through their medication phase so that at least they will be cured. It will not lead to other further uh, problem. Because once they are not cured, we are stigmatizing them. They refuse to take their medication. They didn't get the necessary treatment. It will continue to expand. It will, uh, the disease will be transferable, or how do I put it? It will be transferred to other people. So the society that we are, we are uh, stigmatizing these people, the problem will not be solved. Then the society needs to be reorientated so that at least these people, let's encourage them, give them the necessary support we can. Let them uh, encourage them to take their medication so that they will be cured and the society will also be free. I share your position. Thank you so much, madam. You are welcome. Thank you. Any other question? Any other question to, uh, if no, we will go to the next presentation. Uh, I want to ask to the next presenter whether they are here. Fadei uh, from Nigeria, are you here Fadei? No? The Maithili from India. Maithili from India. Experimental study or mitigation of alkali aggregate reaction in concert structure. No, here the another presenter from India, Nandhini Natarash. Is he here? Nandhini Natarash. Nandini is not here, I think. Co, -co composting of facial sludge treatment plant sludge with the municipal solid waste, not here. The from Sri Lanka, Janar Hat Hanan Jaya, Jaya Gopal. Yeah, yeah, sir, I am here. COVID, so the, the, the Janar, uh, Janar yeah. Hanan Jaya Gopal, sorry, if I missed uh, pronounce your name, I'm not familiar right. with your name. Okay. He will present the COVID-19 identification based on Keras dense net 201 architecture model using CT image is very uh, hot topic actually now because we are in COVID time. So you can uh, present your presentation. Okay, sure. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I, I am happy and lucky being part of the beautiful uh, perform uh, for the researchers. Uh, I am Jenna from Sri Lanka. Uh, so in my uh, uh, research topic is uh, COVID-19 identification based on tech can as uh, dense net uh, 201 architecture modeling using the CT images, CT scan images. Uh, so I am going to explain my uh, research briefly. So in the first one, we know uh, so the uh, what is called coronavirus uh, and uh, infection in your uh, the majorly in fact in your noise and uh, uh, upper throat. Uh, the coronavirus uh, can uh, be spread from one person to another person. We already know that uh, story also. Uh, uh, it's uh, majorly is diagnosed with a laboratory test like a PCR test or antigen test uh, um, uh, or uh, the HS scanning, uh, but in the COVID-19 can uh, lead to the <laughs> failure uh, lasting the lungs and uh, heart, muscular damage so, and the kidney damage also. So in the uh, in this image, uh, in the in this image, uh, it's a, it's a normal. Uh, uh, this is a lungs image of a person uh, affected by a uh, COVID. Uh, but in this image, it's a normal. Uh, person uh, uh, lungs image so it's a healthy person uh, lungs image uh, so in the uh, accuracy of the covid detection by the normal testing is relatively low uh, in, uh, in our country also there are relatively low compared to the 
other advanced technology. So in the standard diagnosis method is a normal uh, laboratory test by detecting for the virus and uh, nuclear acid by the real time was transcription. Uh, so it's a PCR. At the same time, if you're using uh, the DMO, DMO is like finding the pattern of the damages. And another one is a lamp. So it is the same same as the antigen test. Uh, so there is a shortage of experienced doctors or experienced guys to perform the medical examination of the uh, increasing number of the patients. So every day, so in the every day uh, in the world by the COVID-19 patients are increased. So we need uh, much of doctors or much of experienced uh, uh, guys to uh, analyze and examine the uh, reports. So, uh, in the normally, then the clinical reports of 15 percentage to, to 40 percentage of the COVID-19 patients are uh, wrongly identified as a non-COVID-19. So, this is a major fact in India. Uh, so, at the same time, these prediction uh, methods are taking a lot of time. So, if you, for an example, if you uh, uh, took a PCR, uh, then it will be take too much of time to uh, give the results. Right? So uh, that is a major effect in here. Uh, so and also uh, the experience pathologist and experience human pathologist are find the analyzer report. So. A, so, in the, my goal of the project is we propose the automatic method to diagnosis the COVID-19 uh, to discriminate the geometrical structure of the COVID and uh, non-COVID for the CT images. CT images uh, we can get from the uh, 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 lungs, right? It's not lungs. Uh, it's not uh, any other images uh, we can get from the lungs images. Uh, we have uh, used the DensiNet uh, 201 model. This is the uh, model. Uh, uh, it's the free train model, uh, but uh, it's, we apply the transfer learning technique. Uh, so transfer learning le technique also, uh, it's a um, uh, we can't uh, uh, we don't. Uh, uh, have to train uh, train a new model so it's uh, already trained that models but we uh, apply those images to in that model so then after that we find the tuning and then finally uh, we get the uh, answer that, that the image is affected by uh, COVID or not COVID. so that is uh, the major uh, part in, uh, in my project so in the we uh, decided to obtain the higher precision rate uh, rather than the other proposed method which are predict to the uh, use of similar size of data set so we know uh, in the in the medical uh, side so uh, if the data collection is a very uh, harmful process very difficult uh, so we have uh, the similar size of data sets so then if you have the similar size of data set then uh, uh, we uh, take the higher precision so that is a effect so i use that uh, uh, similar data set. So in that data set, maybe Dear Professor, COVID can you CT increase your sound? We have a sound problem. We cannot hear you well. CT data set. Now is good. Uh, if you can stay, talk like that one, it will be nice. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Uh, so in the Densi 2001, so this is a model. Uh, it's a convolutional neural network. Uh, that is a 201 uh, layer deep. So you can load the pre-trained versions uh, of the network uh, trained on more than millions of images for in the, from the image data uh, base. So in the image net, uh, it's like a database. There are a lot of uh, a variety of uh, category images are there. So it's a million image, so totally is a, a million images, a big database. So then uh, train that uh, uh, data to in our uh, uh, density uh, net. So this is one of the model. Uh, so I use in that models uh, for the Keras uh, Keras. So Keras also, uh, we know that one is a Keras is a API. So it's a machine learning, it's a deep learning API uh, uh, written in the uh, Python uh, programming. Uh, so I call the uh, Keras, uh, use the Keras to load the uh, DNS uh, network in the density net. Uh, and then in here, uh, 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 the network has a learned uh, rich features represent for the wide range of images. So there are a lot of variety of images are there. So then they learn from that features, uh, from that uh, images. So the network has uh, 
the image input size in that uh, model input size image is a uh, 224 pixel to uh, 224 pixels so with and height uh, is same same value so 100 224 pixel so this is the model i apply this is the original image so maybe this one is a covid or non covid image uh, we don't we can't we don't know what is the image but if you pass that image uh, and then we use the convolutional uh, uh, layer so in the convolutional layer is a major building blocks using in the convolutional neural network um, and it is simple application on that uh, filter to an input that result in the activation so that is why using the uh, convolutional layer so after that we using in this model so we separate in the two uh, we use the three different small same model but uh, use different different locations so in the uh, one and two and three after that apply the density net and then after that uh, we using the same uh, convolutional layer and then pooling layers also pooling layers we you know you use to the reduce the dimension uh, of the feature mapping so in here i use the max pooling and average pooling uh, so and after that uh, in the final one is a like linear layer so in the linear layer is a learning an average rate of uh, correlation between the input and the output and uh, and then finally the model find that input image uh, is a covid image or non covid image so this is the only for the test test type of output uh, with the uh, uh, corresponding image so that uh, the model is identified this one as a uh, COVID or non COVID. So this is the prediction level. Um, so in the data set, uh, so this, and this is a COVID C, uh, the CT scan data set uh, that CT image, a patient in fact with the COVID 19 were collected from the scientific articles uh, deposited in the, uh, this type of. Uh, um, uh, repository uh, from 19 January uh, 2019 in, uh, to, uh, uh, to March. Uh, uh, in that period, we can collect that uh, images. Uh, uh, some hospital is denoted, uh, donated by, by hospital. And then after that, uh, in here, uh, we have the total image, 349 images are there. Uh, we collect from the only 216 patients. So uh, we know that if you uh, collect any other um, uh, medical images, uh, then uh, we need first we need a concern from the uh, uh, patient. And after that, so this is a long process. So then uh, uh, we collect a few of the images, right? So that is a process. So if you using the similar data set, and then we achieve the higher precision. So this is in in my uh, 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 thought. In, in that uh, uh, major uh, things in the uh, in in the project uh, in the research, and then uh, uh, it's normally it's a uh, uh, similar to that uh, it's a uh, right, uh, and then uh, in here uh, in the database uh, we have the different different sizes of the images are there yeah, uh, mostly. Uh, uh, Two categories, uh, uh, two different size of the images are there. First one is 124 width, and uh, one is a height, and similar to these uh, numbers, uh, one 1485 and 1853, and and then after that we resize the 224 to 224. Why I resize this one? Because our model is model input is 224 into 224 input. So that is the reason uh, to resize the database images. So I just uh, in uh, take it into this one. So this is very, uh, smaller uh, image. So then I increase the size of the image uh, to that uh, number 224 to 224 pixel. Uh, but uh, other category of images are uh, taken uh, to larger. So then I reduce that image uh, into 224. So both. Uh, so now the resize the database. So every day database images are is the same size. So is the width and height are same, similar uh, to the uh, the model uh, uh, input size. Uh, model input size. So after that, uh, this is, is my process of the model. First one is a data processing. So in the data processing, uh, the uh, is a rotation and translation were used for the data uh, augmentations. So these are the processing in level. And then after that, uh, we apply the feature extraction. So in the feature extraction period, so we apply the convolutional neural network. 
convolution and neural network models at the same time apply the density mode density net uh, 201 model uh, were used for the feature extraction so that is the purpose we using that uh, two models and uh, convolution neural network but that, uh, we use that uh, density model uh, and uh, in here uh, we use the transfer learning model so in the transfer learning technique so we don't have to train a new model so we use that model uh, but uh, train uh, fine tuning using this uh, uh, in my data collection and then after that uh, we use in the classifier training so in the classifier training uh, that we use the softmax uh, function in the softmax function uh, it's a binary classification problem uh, which uh, cl which class uh, in our input uh, uh, being uh, either zero or one so in the zero means is covid or one means uh, non-COVID. So it's like a binary classification. So we identify uh, COVID or non-COVID. That is, so that is a normally called as a binary classification. So that's why reason I use that uh, the softmax function. And then after, uh, and then uh, also in this softmax function is give the probability for the each class label. So it's calculate the each probability. And then finally, it was taking the um, maximum probability of the class table. So it's fine, uh, calculate the maximum uh, uh, probability of the class. Uh, so if you, for an example, if you uh, put that input image, maybe uh, COVID, so originally that uh, image also COVID, and then system is identified, uh, the higher probability value is uh, zero. That higher probability value is zero. And then after that, uh, the model, Validation. So in the model validation, uh, normally we use the 10 uh, fold cross validation. I also use that 10 fold cross uh, validation uh, for uh, was used for the validation technique. And after that uh, is a deduction part. So in the deduction part, uh, so in that image uh, was uh, that uh, uh, images were uh, stored uh, according to their labels. So that according to your labels mean either is a normal or abnormal. So normal means COVID or abnormal means it's a non-COVID. So that is the detection part we know, right? So this person is affected by COVID or not. So this is just uh, because uh, uh, if you take uh, took the PCR, then uh, it, uh, it's the one or two or some uh, numbers of a uh, few of number of uh, student, uh, the patient is it, it's uh, easy. But it's a huge number, uh, large number of uh, um, um, people uh, try to uh, get the P uh, PCR, and then it's a difficult. It's one day is not enough. So then it is in, in this uh, method. Uh, uh, I, this is my research, but it's, it's so in my research. If, if you one one day we can get uh, uh, hold the lot of uh, people to uh, uh, analyze the, who are affected the COVID or who are uh, uh, non-COVID person. So that, that is a, it, uh, we can uh, get the uh, CT images. Uh, and then this is the uh, training and validations lost. So it's a training validation lost uh, in here. So it's a uh, blue, po it's, uh, red points are denoted to the lost thing. It's a validation lost. Um, uh, and that uh, and the training lost uh, and the green is uh, denoted to the uh, validation lost. So these are the graph in my uh, uh, research. Uh, so I uh, using the Jupyter network uh, to uh, written the uh, programming language in uh, Python. Uh, so generate that uh, report. Uh, and this is the result. And then uh, this one is the training and the validations accuracy. If you train that models and validate uh, using that data, then, then uh, we can get this type of uh, 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 graph. Um, so in this one is the red points show the accuracy of the training accuracy, or uh, very closer to the one. And then uh, and that, uh, in that validation accuracy uh, is denoted to the green color plot. So these are the up and down. So it's marks are there. Um, and uh, this is the uh, COVID submission metrics for the COVID and non COVID ID. So in, in here, I apply uh, in the text uh, testing data, uh, I use the uh, 74 uh, images as a testing. Uh, used to test 
Uh, so in that, uh, in the again, it's a true label. So non and non COVID and the COVID and the prediction label is the COVID and non COVID. Uh, so uh, in here is a 36 images for the non COVID and then uh, 38 for the COVID. So these are the original labeled. Uh, and then in, in the, this is the prediction label. So in in my system. So. In, in my system is a, in this table is represent the precision and the uh, resell uh, uh, and the F1 score uh, for the uh, COVID-19 classification. So this is the summary of the report uh, for the COVID-19 precision rate and the non-COVID. So in here is a non-COVID to all the images are identified as a, a correct decision. So, but in the, in the COVID in 10 is a, a predict is non-COVID. So, uh, in the future, we will, uh, we will decide to increase that uh, um, uh, rate also. Uh, and uh, this is the average average uh, the accuracy in this one uh, is a fun cross and uh, supported to the all, uh, 74 images. So in the 36 is a COVID and uh, we used uh, uh, 38 uh, non-COVID images for the uh, testing. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is a, uh, if you use uh, in, in I use the 74 images uh, for the testing. So it's a uh, correctly identify everything is a, uh, in this one is a uh, precision rate for the uh, COVID and this one for the, uh, no, the COVID for it is seven percentage, but in the non-COVID is a hundred percentage. Is the overall accuracy in my uh, system um, got 90.94 uh, 90, 90 percentage. Um, so this is the summary of the result of time. So in the non-COVID is 36 and the core <coughs> corrected to identify every, each and every uh, images are correct. Uh, so none of them is not uh, wrongly identified. Uh, but in the COVID is 38 and then 28 is correctly identified, but is 10 is wrong. Uh, so, and then uh, these are the two positive and two negative and four positive. So these values are uh, denoted in, uh, in, the, in the table. Uh, and the final is the sensitive and specialized is a percentage design here. Uh, so in the conclusion of my uh, research, so we proposed a method of uh, COVID-19 uh, chest uh, CT images classification based on the uh, density net. So we using that model uh, for using the transfer learning technique uh, for the, this uh, in my data collection images. Uh, in particular, the method of COVID-19 images classification uh, based on uh, migration learning. So it's a migration learning is, uh, learning uh, can achieve the higher accuracy for the similar data. So that is the highlighted in the similar data. So some other uh, the, uh, research is there either if we use the bigger data set, then okay, it's a, we can get the higher precision. But if you're using the lower da similar data set, uh, is it difficult to get the higher precision? Uh, so it's a, you, we, we train that model. So then, uh, otherwise, the, if you use the train training session, we, uh, we put uh, the, uh, the lot of data. So otherwise, that model can't uh, get the um, uh, features. Right? So that's a problem in uh, uh, in. So, so that's the reason I used to select that uh, type of uh, density net, the model. And then we used the Keras uh, model using that API uh, log that uh, model based on the transfer learning perform the better COVID and the non-COVID image classification for that similar data set in that data set. Here we used the less amount of data for the training. So in the training also, I used the less amount of data. So 230 images, I used the training and the validation. Uh, and the testing also, I just using the 74 images in the total COVID uh, plus and uh, COVID. So in the uh, model FPS, uh, the higher accuracy rather than the wish models are already used to identify the COVID-19 and the similar data set. So, uh, 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 and then the, the model shows 90.94 percentage of uh, testing accuracy only for the 74 samples and the precision for the COVID and the 83 percentage and the 100 uh, percentage. And, uh, uh, and his method is only for the Keras uh, density net 2201 architecture for uh, COVID and the non COVID uh, chest images uh, using the similar data set to higher uh, performance comparably for the proposed other method. Um, so, in the future, I will just uh, um, uh, increase the precision rate for the COVID. So, now is 84, 85. So, in the model, is a uh, uh, 
uh, got the uh, accuracy is 90. So then in the future, we will uh, increase that uh, uh, the uh, accuracy rate. Uh, so that is, is my uh, research. Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. I okay. think you, you you have developed uh, something very beneficial for the humanity. Yeah. Because we have the problem of the COVID detection. I mean, rightly, yeah. uh, the increasing the accuracy of detection. Yeah. Uh, the traditional test, I think they are about 70% uh, accuracy. Your is about 90%, right, sir? Yeah, yeah, accuracy is 90%, but it's a 73% for the COVID, if you identify mm -hmm. the COVID. So then, uh, and how about the, the cost? The cost is, uh, I think, is very low because you use uh, technology, right? The machines or this kind of things. Yeah. So your cost is also lower than traditional methods, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, have you commercialized or uh, have you started to use in any hospital in Sri Lanka? Uh, no, still I am researching, but uh, in, the, in the next year, we will contact the hospitals and implement it. Yeah, if you can uh, apply it slowly, I think it will be beneficial. So the yeah. Professor Dixon, he has asked a question. You can ask, Professor. Yes, thank you so much, Chair. Okay. okay. Um, I think it's a very innovative study and um, I appreciate the hard work yeah. uh, that have been put into this study. Uh, yeah. I need some clarification. I just want you to tell me this. Um, you use the Keras DanceNet 201 model. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I want you to compare this model with the CT based radiomics model, which uh, seems to have a lot of successes per the readings in the literature. So how is your model different from, from this radiomics model? I'm curious uh, so, to know. Yeah, so in this model says mostly the layer size deep, uh, deep layers. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, at the same time, uh, 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 I use some uh, of um, uh, fine tuning layers. Uh, I, if, if you uh, get the model, uh, if you normally already uh, that model is there, so I just remove some layers uh, to uh, increase the uh, accuracy of taking the features from the images. Uh, so. Uh, so that is a. Okay. Thank you. But uh, I want to do this follow up question. Um, how many tests have you run so far? Because okay. based on the results that you give, you did mention that uh, you run 38 different uh, COVID tests and 28 were correct, 10 were wrong or yeah 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 10 is wrong wrongly identified yeah so i would suggest that probably you engage in more more you run more tests yeah yeah but what do you think uh, yeah so because uh, why i used the but only the 30 and 38 and 36 uh, images because uh, in uh, my data set also we have only the, the 344 images so but is that model is a big model so we need to uh, uh, training purpose we uh, use uh, uh, a lot of images so otherwise uh, that uh, that models can't take any other features from that uh, images uh, yeah, so, exactly. so yeah. So then, I said, because this is the no, this is the image uh, medical based image collection. So it is difficult. It's a harmful purpose uh, uh, to go to the hospital and then there are a lot of procedures are there. Then after that, they collect that one. So is it the data collection is very uh, difficult. Uh, so in the in the other other areas maybe if you collect any other leaf images or anything and then we can use uh, take it in the photos and then uh, much of data we can collect it 
but in here is a problem in that one so my research is maybe is go to the next level then i show this proto uh, per, uh, prototype and then after that uh, go to the next step i then collect the much of uh, images